Good afternoon and welcome to our demonstration of Babbage's Difference Engine. Uh, my name is Tim, this is Chuck. Uh, we're a couple of volunteers here going to find this machine up for you. Now, I'd like to begin by asking how many people in the uh, group here remember things like this? Books of mathematical table, right? Yeah, so if you're old enough to have grey hair or no hair, you're probably used to things. <laughs> so any engineer or scientist will walk around with a book of tables like this and, and a slide rule, of course. Right? It's a slide rule for the quick calculations and the book of tables when you want great, greater precision. Well, if you did use books like this, did you ever stop to think how they were created? I know I didn't. Well, they were laboriously created by human computers doing the calculations by hand. Pencils and paper, and then when they'd done the calculations, printers had to set them a little type to go print the books. Not surprisingly, the books contained errors. And in the early part of the 19th century, at the height of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, a young English mathematician by the name of Charles Babbage was so appalled at the state of the tables, engineers building bigger and bigger structures, navigators at sea doing complex calculations and trigonometry to figure out where they are, and he said, well, if the books have errors, lives and property are at stake. So he set about providing a machine which would solve this problem, produce flawless tables. Now, to give you a sense of what that uh, involved, I'm going to ask Chuck here to turn this machine on, just let you see it briefly in operation. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you plenty more of this in a moment. But let me step aside here so you folks can see it. <laughs> So, check us out power source, no electricity of course. Well, when Babbage proposed to build his machine, it was about 1823. And he said he was going to build a machine which would require 25,000 precision mechanical parts. At the time when a complex machine, maybe a steam engine, had maybe 100 parts, all laboriously finished by hand. This was before the time of mass production and so on. It was going to be an extremely <coughs> expensive undertaking. So he appealed to the British government for support. Now, unlike today, back then, governments generally didn't support science. Science was a rich gentleman's pastime. And although Babbage himself was a rich gentleman, he wasn't nearly rich enough to undertake this project on his own. But because of the importance of these tables to navigation, and the fact that Britain was the preeminent maritime nation at the time, the government thought this was a worthy cause. He said, sure, we will support you. And so he started a project to actually try and build his machine. And he estimated it would take him three years. Well, he ended up spending about £17,000 of the British government's money. It doesn't sound a lot today, but back then somebody figured out it was enough to buy 29 brand new steam engines and steam locomotives from uh, Stevenson's works. So it was a huge sum of money. And ten years into the project, things went wrong. Not for technical, but rather for political and uh, financial reasons, and the project collapsed. He was only halfway through making those 25,000 parts. He put together a small demonstration piece, today they call it the Beautiful Fragment, and in our Revolution exhibit you can see a half-scale model of it. It worked perfectly, demonstrated that his machine would have worked if it had been completed, and it still works to this day. But, there it rests. Now you might have thought, having put so much effort into the project, which collapsed, he would have had enough of calculating engines and would have moved on to other things. But no, in fact he already had the ideas for how to make a much more sophisticated machine which he ultimately called his analytical engine. Now, he only designed it on pencil and paper, but had he built it, it would have been recognizable to us as a general purpose programmable digital computer, programming punch cards. Tr tr tremendously complex machine. Well, from that effort, he learned how to simplify his mechanisms, and in 1848 he said, I now know how to build a, a difference engine 
much better than the original one that I thought I was going to build. Only needs one third the number of parts, has greater calculating capacity. We offered the idea to the British government and said, thank you very much, but we've spent enough money on your projects, we don't want it. And so, there it lay. After he died, his work passed largely into obscurity. The materials all passed through his family's estate and eventually ended up in the archives of the Science Museum in London. Now, if you'd read the history books up to about 1980, they would tell you that Babbage had failed because the Victorian engineering of his day could not make the parts to sufficient precision for his machine to have worked. We now know that's absolutely not the case. Uh, but it took until the 1980s for anybody to really go and seriously understand what Babbage had done. Now, before we get there, let's take a closer look at what you actually see here. So this is called this difference engine number two. It's called a difference engine because of the mathematical principle on which it's based, something called the method of finite differences. And it's number two because this is his second design. Now this particular one is also number two because there are two of these in existence in the world and this is the second one. The way those human computers, or one of the ways those human computers produced these tables was using this method of differences. And it's a nice trick that reduces the problem to just a long string of additions and subtractions. You need nothing more complex than that once you get started. So you can think this machine really is just an elaborate adding machine. But what's important about it was that it was automatic. One set, Chuck over there is providing power, but nothing else. At least in principle, he doesn't need to understand the mathematics, and he doesn't need to understand the mechanism. He's just the power source. Now, in practice, it's not quite that simple. It's a very fussy machine, so it's a skilled job operator. What you can see, if you look closely, are columns of wheels with numbers engraved on them. Each of these columns can store a single decimal number of up to 31 digits. There are eight columns. And in the method of differences, we're going to take each column and add it to the column on its left, all the way down the line. And after seven additions, we have a new result on the column over here. Now, Babbage knew it was no use having a human read the numbers off this column. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. In fact, this is a good thing. We, we're doing a calculation today of a mathematical expression the mathematicians call a polynomial. This is it. If you remember a little bit of algebra. It's a sum of terms of some variable x raised to a power, multiplied by a number, and all these terms added up and so on. This is the way the mathematicians would approximate the table, and then we're going to make a table of values of this for different values of x. Well, this is what we're doing, and right now x has the value 350. So if I asked you to work this out for x is 350, it would take a while with a pencil and paper, right? I'd like somebody to help here. Do you care to check these numbers for me? See that line? I want you to hold this, and you see the line that says 350? I'm going to read what the machine says, and I want you to compare it with that and see if it's right. So the answer we have on here right now says 512978402451248394. Is that what it says? We choose to have got a modern computer to tell us what to expect. <laughs> well, it does get the answer right. It does. Well, Babish knew that it was no good having me read that number off and hand it to the printer to go print the table because one or other of us would make a mistake. So instead, this machine has what would have been the world's first automatic typesetter attached to the end of it here. As the results are produced, they get sand off here through gears and racks and so on, down to a set of print wheels, and you can see the paper here. Now, if you look closely, you'll see there's nothing on the paper. That's because this is Victorian printing technology. It uses water-based inks. If we put ink in it, uh, then we have to strip the whole thing down, clean it and dry it. It takes many hours, and we're volunteers. So it will go through the motions. <laughs> but the more important output was actually not that. That's really just for checking, so we can see we've set it right and we're getting the answers we expect. The more important output would have been produced in the trays below. These would have been filled with a soft material like plaster of Paris. And as each result is produced, punches come down and make an impression in that, recording the, the numbers. And the tray moves so that we can format a whole page of results. Once it's done and the plaster is set, we can pour hot lead on it and make a printing plate to go in our printing press, so with no human interaction. And you can see an example in the display cabinet over there of a completed uh, tray. Okay, so we're going to fire it up again, and what I want you to watch is, on this end, this is the control mechanism. This is where all the clever stuff is. A set of cams that, as they rotate, move levers back and forth, driving bars through here, that orchestrate this sequence of lifting and turning motion which accomplish, which accomplish the arithmetic. And then towards the end of each calculation, you'll see the printer become active as it records that result. So give us a few more cycles here. 
see the lifting of columns or the turning of the wheels. And it's taking about eight seconds to produce each result. Four turns of that track. Let me get the next one. Now what I'd like everybody to do is to move around the back of this machine. Because on the front we can see the numbers, but around the back there's some rather interesting stuff. If you know if you do arithmetic with pencil and paper when you add two numbers together, if the answer comes out to be bigger than 9, you're going to have to carry one to the next column, right? And if I ask you to add 1 to 999, nine, nine, you're going to say 9 plus 1, that's 0, carry the 1. Oh, and I've got 1 plus 9, that's another 0, carry the 1. So we have to do it in order from low digit to high digit. Well, this machine is doing the same arithmetic. It has to do the same thing. Give us another cycle from this side. I'll sit down here and be wet. What does that remind you of? DNA, yes, it's the machine's DNA. Well, this helical structure you see here is not just made to so that it looks pretty. There was a very good reason for this. The mechanism on the back side of the machine here is where the machine stores the information that says a wheel has gone past nine, we need to carry one. And after we're done with adding all the wheels together on the front, we then have to process all those carries. And they have to be done in sequence from the low digit to the high digit. So as that column rotates, these steel arms you see sticking out here pull those registers one digit at a time from the bottom to the top, and everything happens in the right sequence. All over in the blink of the night, it's very hard to actually see it in operation, but that's what's going on back here. Okay. Now, the last part of the mechanism, this machine has 8,000 parts in it. 4,000 of them are in that calculating section. You can see lots of repetition. The other 4,000 are in the printing apparatus here, where there's hardly any repetition at all. There's a lot of complexity here, but it's not very obvious. And what I was just concerned about is laying out the page with the results. So he gave us the provision on the end here to control do we go down a row and then down the, sorry, down a column, then down the next column, or do we go along a row and then along the next row? We can control how many rows and columns on a page, what the spacing between rows and columns are. We can put extra space every fifth row to guide the eye, make it a little easier to read and so on. You can ask two different font sizes. <laughs> That's all controlled mechanically by the apparatus on the end here. Now, remember this was designed with pencil and paper, and he never actually built this machine. But he thought through every little detail. So, for example, with the method of differences, it turns out every answer depends on the previous answer. That's why it's called the method of differences, because what we do to get the next answer is have the difference from the previous one. So if every answer depends on the previous one, it's very important when we get to the end of a page, that we stop. Because we need to put fresh plaster in there to catch the next result. And if we overshoot, we're going to lose an answer, we're going to have to go back and set the machine again. So he thought of that too. When you get the last answer on the last row, it drops a weight under here, pulls the cord that runs across the front of the machine and disconnects the handle. So a chuck down there can't produce any more results until we put a new tray in. Every little detail worked through. Okay, so watch this end of the machine here. We have two weights. These are providing the power to move the tray in two directions. You can see as the path of the paper moves, you should see the tray move this way. There it goes on to the next one. So, we're ready for the next answer now. And then move it again. But it's all entirely automatic. You get to the end of a row, it moves to the next column, the weights rewind. It's just absolutely magic. Okay, so come back around the front. The only input one thing is that you have to do that. You might expect to bring several thousand answers to the answer approximation of a particular polynomial set. You just want to provide basically the entire book. You wouldn't do the entire book because um, the method the method of using the polynomial is an approximation. And you have to figure out over what range is it valid and then switch to a different approximation. There's a lot of technicalities of that sort of actually using the machine to actually. Well, we, we, we've calculated, for instance, it, the other thing you can see in our display case over there is an example book of tables. That's a seven figure logarithm table. Have it own. We estimate to produce that book on this machine would take, Chuck here, crank away eight hours a day for a month. So it would be a big undertaking. How much force does it? Turn that thing. Well, um, you, you can 
see that this thing has got a gear reduction system on it. Mm -hmm. It was originally designed with the uh, crank right on the main shaft, so it was a one-to-one -one turn. When I first built the machine, I quickly discovered that that's throwing about 140 pounds of force on its feet. Well, the Victorians were obviously a lot stronger than we are, so... Yeah, so, <laughs> so they put this four-to-one reduction here, so at the peak, the, the load varies as I go along, and I've got to keep it steady. Yeah, it's, uh, I get about 25 to 20 pounds. So this, this machine has a certain speed it likes to go at. If you go too fast or too slow, it has a tendency to jam. So it's actually quite a skilled job of turning that track because you've got to keep it steady even though the load varies so much. Mm. Well, so I mentioned that, that Babbage's work fell into obscurity, it landed in the archives of the Science Museum in London, and there it lay until about 1980 when scholars really went into that archive and started to study what was there and were astounded by what they found level of detail. There are something like 5,000 pages of handwritten notebooks, uh, thousands of pages of drawings, notations, that he invented a system of mechanical notation that allowed him to reason in symbols about how the parts of the machine would work. Um, and what they discovered was that there were a set of 20 drawings which described difference engine number two, and they looked fairly complete and consistent. And so the new curator of computing there, Doran Swade, got to wondering, well, if the old story said that Babbage couldn't build this because Victorian engineering wasn't good enough, why hasn't somebody come back later and actually built it? And so they set about a project to do just that, and to answer two questions. Could it have been done with the methods and materials available to Babbage? And if it had been built, would it have worked? And as I hope you've just seen, the answer to both of those questions is a resounding yes. What you're looking at here is five tons of bronze, cast iron, and steel, the materials that Babbage would have used. They started this project around 1985. And the goal was to complete it by 1991. That would have been the bicentenary of Babbage's birth. He was born in 1791. And the Science Museum in London was mounting an exhibit to celebrate Babbage's 200th birthday, with the centerpiece being a different age. Well, it turned out they only managed to complete the calculating part. They had many of the same problems that Babbage himself did, raising the money for one. <laughs> one of their prime contractors went out of business partway through the project, and so on. All sorts of difficulties. But by 1991, they did indeed finish the calculating part, and they fired it up, and it worked, just like Babbage said it would. There were a few little rough edges, a few things that had to be modified and corrected, but remember, this was an engineering project that had been sitting around for 150 years, just waiting to be completed. And if any of you are engineers, you know, there's always this phase in this kind of project, we call it debugging, right? Mm -hmm. find little things we have to so there were a few things, but, but nothing of principle. Now, they also knew that it was essential in Babbage's concept to build the printing apparatus. Because the whole point of this machine was to produce the plates from which we could print mass-produced books with no errors. But they couldn't build the printing apparatus because they simply didn't have the money. And so the project was sat. And then several years later, I think it was 1995, an event was held at the Science Museum. A young man you've probably heard of, Bill Gates, he'd just written a book called The Road Ahead, where it's predicting the future. And he decided to have the European launch of that book in the Science Museum, standing in front of the different engineers. Well, Doran Swade, the curator, joined up a few dots. He said, Bill Gates, Microsoft, money. Maybe they will fund us to build the printer. Well, it turned out that Microsoft politely declined. So sorry, we don't get into that kind of thing. But we do have an executive who's interested in this kind of stuff, and we suggest you talk to him. His name is Nathan Meabold. He used to be the chief technical officer at Microsoft for a while. And eventually he agreed, and he said, yes, I will fund the museum to build the printing apparatus, but I'm going to put a condition on it. When you've done it, I want you to build a complete second copy of the machine for my private collection. <laughs> and that is the machine you see before him. He has generously loaned it to us so that we can demonstrate it to you. So what you see here was actually completed, the second one, it was completed in 2008. We packaged it in a red big crate, stuck it on a 747 and flew it over here. And we are now very happy to be able to demonstrate it to you. Uh, it's pretty much identical to the first copy which is still in the Science Museum in London. But whereas we fire this up and show you it every day, the one in London is only demonstrated very rarely these days. So this is a unique opportunity to actually see this thing. You said that part of the point was to prove that it could be made in yes. Gavage's time? So the first thing they did was they looked at the surviving artifacts from the period, in particular that beautiful fragment <coughs> that they assembled in 1832, and they made measurements, they did metallurgy to find out what materials were used in that conductor, among the materials that were equivalent. And then they uh, made parts where they required no closer tolerance than we know from measurements that they were able to achieve by then. And in fact, this particular machine you see 
took six years to assemble from the parts because they were all hand finished in just the way they would have been in Babbage's day. Mm -hmm. So they were fitted together just like they would have been hand finished back then. But the, the actual parts were modern. Oh, the, the parts were unashamedly made on modern numerical control machines. Yeah. Otherwise, we would have still been waiting in 50 years. Mm -hmm. you know. they, they had this crazy idea when they started the project back in 1985 that they might use the authentic methods and, in fact, the original machines oh, yeah. to make parts. And they quickly decided that was probably a bad move. So, yes, so parts were made to no greater precision than we know uh, Babbage was able to achieve. It was just the fact that back then it was so hugely labor intensive, phenomenally expensive, took forever. Um, so now we know for sure that yes, it would have worked, and it could have been built back then. Now, not everybody believed back then that the machine was necessary, because these tables, after all, already existed. People had calculated them by hand. It's only this question of how important the errors were. So different people had different opinions as to how important the actual problem was. Um, let me uh, ask you, you guys if you've got any questions here on the things that I may or may not have talked about here. What maintenance is this? Oh, we uh, maintain it roughly once a month, which is mostly just lubrication. Occasionally we have things go wrong and we have to deal with them. Um, like any piece of Victorian machinery like that, it does require a lot of maintenance. Of course, we only give it you know, 20 cycles a day or something when we demonstrate. If it had been in real use, of course, they would have been cranking day in and day out. So it would have probably required a good deal more. 